Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled, Are Your Students Ready for College? Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Please note, um, all attendees are muted and the video is disabled. This session is also being recorded and the recording will be available within one to two business days on our website at ce.uci.edu. Please visit our free events page and I click on the on demand tab to view the recording. I will also email recordings available along with a PDF copy of today's presentation. My name is Keisha Batan Sankai and I'm a program coordinator here at UCI Division of Continuing Education. So for today, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you all know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. And then I'll give you a brief overview of our independent educational consultant certificate program, which is fully online. I will then provide a program overview and registration information regarding the upcoming summer quarter, which begins in June. And then I will turn it over to our guest presenter, Dr. Eric Endlich. And then at the end of his presentation, if we have time, we will have a brief Q&A session. And then I will leave you also with my contact information so you can send over any additional questions we did not get to address. The camera and microphones have been disabled for participants. However, please utilize the chat feature. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a row of icons. You can click on a chat bubble icon and a panel will show up. In fact, if you want to practice utilizing the chat panel right now, um, I'd like to see where are, where is everyone um, watching this webinar from? I will start. I am watching this webinar from hopefully everyone can see it. If you have any questions for me or Dr. Endlich regarding the content of this presentation at any time, please submit in the chat and we will address it at the end of presentation. And I see that everybody, um, almost everybody participating. Hello from Oklahoma, Minneapolis, dual Minneapolis and Florida. Great, welcome, welcome all. Down the street in Garden Grove, welcome. <laughs> Okay, so here is a brief overview of the Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program. So this program is fully online and provides the knowledge and skills that's needed to fully understand the college admissions process and how to meet the needs of varied clients. It is developed and taught by industry experts and accomplished educational consultants. You will also acquire the basic skills that's required to start, open, and expand a successful and ethical educational consulting business. This program is designed for a number of audiences. We have individuals who transition into college admissions from other careers like high school counseling or administration. We also have some individuals looking to develop their business model and marketing plan in order to launch their own private practice. Then we also have people who are already practicing IECs but are seeking professional development opportunities. So the student populations in this program varied but guarantee that when you enroll in the program, you can find and you can relate to some of the people that are enrolled in this program. Okay, so the program requirement. The certificate program is composed of five required courses and two electives. So that adds up to seven courses or 15 units. To be eligible for the certificate, you must complete all seven classes with the letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy and request for certificate. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I typically advise students to take a few classes first before they apply just to make sure they want to commit to the entire full program. As I mentioned previously, our certificate program consists of seven online courses. Here you can see the five required courses, um, principles of independent education consulting, navigating the financial aid network, college admissions consulting resources, developing an business and independent educational consulting practicum. We highly, highly recommend that if you're brand new to this field, you should take the principles course first. There is a prerequisite for the practicum course as noted here, and that is you must complete all these four required courses before you can enroll in the practicum. We also offer a variety of very interesting electives, such as working with students with learning differences, marketing and PR for educational consultant, counseling techniques for IECs, 
Consulting Transfer, Summer and Gap Year Students, American College Consulting for the International Student, International College Consulting for the American Student, and Fundamentals of Graduate School Admissions. So there's everything for everybody. Um, you don't have to take everything. You, Of course, you only take two elective courses, but because of the variety, I'm sure everybody can find whatever that they may need. Now, in the upcoming summer quarter, we will be offering these required courses, Principles of IEC, Navigating the Financial Aid Network, College Admissions Consulting Resources, Developing an IEC Business, and Independent Educational Consulting Practicum. Here you can see each course is listed with its start and end date, and then the online course fee of $735 per course. Right now, registration is currently open and students might enroll either online or by calling our student service office, as you see the number here on the screen. Courses in this program fill up very quickly, so I always recommend students to enroll sooner rather than later to secure your spot in the class. Now for the electives, we will be offering four courses. Working with students with learning differences, marketing and PR for the educational consultant, American College Consulting for the international student, and fundamentals of graduate school admissions. Again, you'll see the start and end date of the courses, and each course might have different start date um, from the others. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website, as you can see here on the address on the screen. Now we'll be talking about the costs. Each course costs $735. So for seven courses, you're looking at $5,145. You do not pay this entire total upfront. You simply pay for each course individually at a time of enrollment. And then there's also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program. So in the end, um, the tuition plus the candidacy fee, you are looking at around 5,270. Please note that amount is not equal textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page. So you'll know if course materials are required before you new enroll in a class. We also provide discount for members of HECA and IECA. Members of these associations are given a 10% discount on courses within our independent educational consultant program. For membership question or to receive the discount code if you are already a member, please follow the directions on our website. Okay, so right here, this is a screenshot of our upcoming summer course offerings. So please note that when you're viewing the course schedule, not all classes are offered every single quarter. So please plan accordingly. This is also available on our website. And then this is a screenshot of our IEC certificate program brochure, which you can download from our website. Similar to the website, this brochure contains general information, the program overview, who should attend, the benefits, certificate requirements, and the curriculum, which includes all the courses. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining. We're glad to see so many people are interested in learning more about your students' readiness for college and how you can best help them during this period of time in their lives. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Endlich so he can provide an introduction and begin his portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, Keisha. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Glad to see folks from not only all over the country, but from outside of the US as well. I went through the UCI IEC certificate program myself. It was well worth it. Nobody is paying me to say that. Um, <laughs> I just want I just uh, want to endorse it. And uh, you know, this is partly my way of giving back to a program that was very helpful. And I made great professional connections too with other students and to the teachers who I've stayed in touch with. So uh, lots of benefits to the program. And um, it's great to be talking to future IECs or current IECs um, about this topic. Are your students ready for college? So I am an IEC with a background being a clinical psychologist. I'm based in the Boston, Massachusetts area, but my students are worldwide. And I have a particular focus of students with learning differences such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia, as well as other disabilities. And so uh, this topic of College readiness is near and dear to my heart. Um, Please let me know if you're able to the, navigate the presentation. Okay, and there, you go. there we go. Okay, great. 
So uh, we're going to talk about why the topic of college readiness is important, what that even means, college readiness, what that consists of, and how students can get to that point of college readiness. So college readiness is particularly important for students that I work with, students with learning differences, because on average, you know, looking nationwide, 60% of students graduate college after six years, which is in itself a somewhat disappointing figure that to a lot of people who are not familiar with the, the overall graduation rate. So people talk about four year colleges, but a, a large chunk of students haven't even graduated after six years. But the uh, figures for students with learning differences are even more un, kind of uh, discouraging in that after eight years, less than half of students with learning differences are graduated. So it's critical that students start college when they are fully ready so that they can make good progression, thrive and graduate on time. The cost of not graduating on time, never mind not graduating at all, is huge. Think about how much it costs for each year of college and the lost income for each year that you haven't gotten into the workforce yet. And then for students who don't finish at all or who see their peers graduating before them, emotionally, it can be very costly. And unfortunately, the cost of the, the value of a part of a degree is not that great. Sure, you may learn useful things, but in terms of how it looks on your resume, how much employers value three years of a college degree, employers are looking for that college degree. And if you say, oh, I almost graduated, I was only a couple of few credits short, that really doesn't help you that much in terms of your lifetime earnings and in terms of your employability, uh, even though you may have learned a great deal during that time. So graduating and graduating on time is, is super important from a cost standpoint, from a career standpoint, point and from an emotional standpoint. Another fun fact, most students with learning differences don't disclose in college that they have a learning difference. So of course, they can't get accommodations, never mind supports, services, and um, they're less likely to thrive because they're not getting uh, all their needs met. So what does college ready mean? Well, first of all, let's distinguish between college capable and college ready. If students are in high school or secondary school and they are taking reasonably challenging courses, honors, AP, IB, dual enrollment in a community college, if they're taking challenging courses and and getting B's or A's or the equivalent, then there's a, it's reasonable to assume that they will be able and ready to handle college level academics, that they are college capable, that, they, that it's reasonable for them to think about going to a four-year college or a two-year college. But that doesn't mean that they are ready for college because they also have to be able to handle independence. If they're gonna move out, live in a residence hall, eat in a dining hall, join clubs, have to self-advocate in college, there's a lot more to succeeding in college than just being able to handle the, le the academic level of difficulty. Um, these are all, um, all those campus pictures are ones that I've taken on tours in case you're curious where they were. That was Lynn College in Florida. Um, so what is college readiness? So uh, thanks to Jake Weld from Mansfield Hall, um, here this is one definition. Students need to be able to figure out when they need help independently. That means if they're struggling in a course, falling behind, not understanding, they need to be able to realize that on their own and say, hmm, I'm really struggling. I don't know what's going on. I'm not understanding the material. I got to do something about it. That's just an academic example. It could be in an emotional uh, realm where they are starting to become anxious or depressed. It could be in a social realm where they're not making any friends and feeling very lonely. They need to figure that out on their own because their parents aren't there monitoring them. Then they need to take the next step, which is to seek out services to address those needs. So in the case of an academic need, it could be going to the tutoring center. It could be going to speak to the professor during office hours. It could be getting uh, going, going to a writing center. Uh, in the case of emotional needs, it could be going to a counseling center. And then finally, they need to apply those supports or, or the, what they've learned. So if you, if you go and talk with your professor and your professor gives you some useful information on, on how to catch up and how to understand what's going on, 
course, you need to follow that advice. And if you can do all of those three things completely independently, you're probably in good shape to start college. When I talk about all these college readiness skills, I don't mean to imply that, that all students who graduate college or all students who are making their way through college have mastered 100% of these skills. These are just sort of the ideals to strive for or the things that students should be thinking about and working on in order to, to be successful in college. And let me just talk about emotional readiness in particular briefly, partly because I'm a clinical psychologist, so this is you know, near and dear to my heart, but also because emotional readiness is easy to overlook, right? It's not very tangible. Think about other things like uh, say doing laundry. You know, if, if a student's living at home and they're getting ready to go off to college, that might be something that comes up. Hey, you're gonna have to do your own laundry. Let, let me show you how to do your laundry. Or if they are already in college, maybe they go to the, um, the RA in their residence hall and say, hey, uh, I don't know how this machine works. Can you help me? But emotional readiness is not so obvious. It's more subtle, but it can really um, make or break a student's success in college. And in fact, that's partly why I became an IEC because I had seen as a psychotherapist, I had seen students who didn't even make it through the first year of college because they became depressed and dropped out. So to be emotional ready, you need to have that self-awareness. Number one, when you are under stress, how do you react? Are you a student who becomes anxious avoidant, depressed, procrastinate? Do you isolate socially? Do you start sleeping more? Do you stop eating, stop exercising? Do you develop addictive habits like excessive gaming, social media, alcohol, drugs? So you gotta know that about yourself. What, what are you susceptible to? A anxiety, depression, addictions, eating disorders. Secondly, what are the red flags that that is starting to happen? What are the signs for you that you're falling back into that pattern that maybe happened to you when you were in high school, when you were under stress, when you encountered some big change or challenge? Um, so it might be, you know, uh, I'm, I noticed that I'm not responding to my friends' texts anymore, that I'm not hanging out with my friends, that I stopped going to the gym, that I stopped, that I started skipping meals or being extremely vigilant about what I'm eating. Uh, you wanna be able to know what those red flags are so that if they happen in college, you can pick up on that and realize, uh-oh, I'm starting to get depressed again. And then thirdly, have some strategies so that if you become anxious, depressed, or whatever your particular um, vulnerability is, have some go-to strategies. Maybe that's meditation, maybe it's medication, maybe it's exercise, maybe it's uh, writing in a journal, maybe it's um, you know uh, petting a dog, whatever that might be. You wanna have a list of strategies that help you whenever you have those challenges. And then finally, as sort of a backup, uh, you need to know where to get more help if your go-to strategies aren't working. So let's say it's depression and your go-to strategies are exercising and meditating and um, going for a walk in the woods and looking at pictures of your family pet. Um, if you do all those things and you get back on track, great. But you also need to know where to go for help if you don't get back on track. And of course, most colleges have availability of free mental health counseling. Uh, but you might need medication. You need to know, is that something you can get at college? Do you have to uh, go somewhere else? And, um, you know, those are things you want to sort of identify in advance. So that's emotional readiness. Let's step back again. Look at the difference between college and high school. Many key differences. I'm just highlighting a few. So in high school, students are often really scheduled much of the day, very structured time from the time that perhaps their parents wake them up in the morning and they rush through breakfast, get on the bus or get in the car, go to school. They're in school all day after school. Maybe there's a band practice or a sports practice or SAT prep or homework, dinner, more homework, going to bed. Students' days are quite structured in high school and they have a lot of hours in class. It's the reverse in college. And you've all presumably uh, been to college, so you know that you could you could have one or two or three days out of the week where you have no class whatsoever, where you have your whole day free, very unstructured, but lots of assignments, lots of reading, long, big projects. And as a college student, you need to be able to structure that and handle that. You need to be able to handle your own time, plan your time well. Um, those are skills that, that students don't need as much in high school, particularly because they tend to have a support network in place in high school. And sometimes these supports are 
obvious and visible, like they're, um, they're on an education plan and they have a resource room at high school and a special ed teacher um, or a tutor or executive function coach. But some of those supports in high school are somewhat invisible or not so obvious, um, specifically their parents. So if it's their parents telling them, hey, turn off your phone and go to bed. Hey, don't forget to, to put that assignment in your backpack and bring it to school tomorrow. <clears throat> then those supports are gonna disappear when they're in college. And students need to seek those supports out themselves because that safety net has disappeared. So students have to seek it out in college because their parent isn't there saying, hey, you should go see a tutor, you should go see a counselor. So it, you, you see the theme here, lots of independence, lots of, of initiation required on the part of the student. Oops, we seem to have skipped a slide. There we go. So three main skills that I talk about for college readiness, three main categories of skills. First is self-awareness, knowing yourself. That should already sound familiar from stuff I was talking about earlier. Knowing what you're good at, knowing what, what's hard for you. Second is advocating for yourself. That means stepping up and uh, getting the resources, asking for resources, speaking up and um, setting things up on your own. And the third is managing things in your life, whether it's your time, your money, your reactions to events. Um, in case you're wondering, that's Olin College in Needham, Massachusetts, an engineering college, which is, uh, I happen to live in Needham. Self-awareness, oops, seem to be jumping ahead here. Self-awareness, see there's some of the, some examples of being aware of yourself, obviously knowing what you're good at in school, what things are harder for you. So when are you gonna need additional supports academically? Knowing when you need help, knowing what are the conditions under which you learn best? Do you learn when you, do you study best at night or in the morning? Do you study best by yourself in a quiet environment? You study best if there are people around you um, to kind of keep you from getting um, going off track. Uh, people have different conditions that work better for them. Some people like to study listening to music or some some background white noise. You need to know these about things about yourself. Do you need uh, what kind of uh, additional helps do you need for studying? Are you more visual? Are you more verbal? Do you need uh, you know printed notes, notes from the, the instructor, and so on. We talked about handling stress already. Also, how do you handle conflict? You're most likely gonna be living with a roommate in a residence hall. What if you've had an agreement about noise levels or bedtimes or light levels or space um, where you know one person's space and the other person's begin or how neat or messy the room is. If, there, if that you run into conflict in any of these areas, how are you gonna deal with that? Are you gonna avoid it and pretend it doesn't happen? Sort of bury your head in the sand? Are you gonna get angry and have an outburst? Or are you gonna calmly have a conversation with your roommate? Um, these are things that are important to know about yourself in case you fall into bad habits or bad patterns. Um, same thing for, for romantic relationships. College is, for some students, the first opportunity where they've had uh, more serious romantic involvement and it's good to know what a healthy relationship looks like. So you don't fall into the first opportunity that comes along and get into an unhealthy relationship and be exploited, exploited or abused, which is you know, sadly very common um, for, for students who are more naive. And then of course you have a medical condition, diabetes, um, thyroid condition, whatever it might be. You need to know what, when you need help. Um, can you handle that condition on your own? Are there certain things that might happen that would be cause for making an appointment with a doctor or going to urgent care? Next, as I mentioned, self-advocacy, that is speaking up and stepping up. That means with your instructors, going to them with questions, concerns, speaking up in class, in college, sometimes participation is a significant chunk of your grade. So you've got to get comfortable with speaking up. Even if you're uncomfortable, you've got to step outside your comfort, comfort zone. You, there are lots and lots of resources at college. Any college you, you name, there are gonna be lots of resources there such as academic advising, but you as the student typically have to make the appointment. The academic advisor is not gonna come and knock on your door and say, hey, I haven't seen you all semester. So 
Um, if you're trying to figure out what to major in, when to declare a major, what courses to take, how many courses to take in your major, lots of questions that can come up. Take the initiative, meet with your academic advisor. Same thing with tutoring, know when you need help. Uh, most colleges I've seen offer free peer tutoring. Sometimes they offer professional tutoring at an additional fee. Great resources, but the student has to step up and, and take advantage of it themselves. Same thing with mental health counseling, physical health needs. There's often a health center on campus and career advice. So many students, unfortunately, go to a college where there's a great career center, job board, interview coaching, um, sometimes suits for interviews, help with LinkedIn profiles, all kinds of resources in the career center. But if you wait until your senior year and then say, hey, I, I gotta get a job soon. I wonder if I should reach out to the career center. You're not really fully taking advantage of the resource. You really should be doing that early in your college career. Find out what the resources are. Maybe they can help you get an internship early in college. But again, if the student doesn't step forward and advocate for themselves, it's not gonna happen. And sometimes there are barriers. Um, going back to that first definition, students have to advocate and seek out resources, even if there are obstacles. So you show up and the office is closed or uh, the, the people that you need to speak to are busy, or there's a problem with the website. You have to keep going even if you encounter barriers. You can't just say, oh, well, I tried the career website and it crashed, so I'm not gonna see career services. You gotta continue to persevere despite obstacles. We talked about um, addressing tensions with roommates and going back to self-awareness, if you are not good at that, then you should know that about yourself, that you don't know how to handle conflict and you should learn those skills. Maybe you go to a counselor, maybe you talk to people that you know who are better at those things and, and um, pick their brains to learn those skills rather than just saying, oh, well, I'm not good at that. Because when, when that problem comes along, um, you are gonna have a, a lot of problems if you haven't um, built those skills or found some resources to help you. Fortunately, if you're living in the residence hall, there's usually an RA, a designated person to help you with any challenge that comes along and point you to the right resources. So the RA can be a great resource to help you find other resources, but you have to have that self-advocacy to seek them out and say, hey, I'm having this issue. Maybe it's personal, emotional, maybe it's academic. Um, you know, I'm not sure where to go. I'm not sure who to talk to about this. The RA who's um, more experienced at the college will be able to point you in the right direction. And then finally, um, in terms of your social life, again, no one is going to knock on your door. Well, I shouldn't say no one. It, it could happen, but you can't assume that your social life is just going to fall into place. You're just going to meet tons of new friends and it's all going to happen automatically. You may need to go onto the website, find out, or go to a um, um, club fair whatever they call it at your college, find out what clubs are offered and try out a few different clubs that are of interest or look at the notices, uh, virtual or physical notices around campus of different events going on and try some things until you uh, start meeting people and developing a network. And if you don't seek out those opportunities, you could go through college not making any friends and miss out, miss out on one of the best opportunities you'll ever have because in college, you're all the same age, you're all in the same situation, you're all wanting to make new friends. So it's a perfect opportunity to make friends. And the third pillar of, of college readiness, self-management. That means managing all the different aspects of your life, such as your sleep, your hygiene, showering and bathing regularly. Maybe it sounds obvious as an adult, like who wouldn't do that? But, you know, I, I do see families where uh, kids struggle with that. So regular nutrition, getting, paying attention to the hours when the, re, when the uh, dining hall is open and getting yourself there and eating regular balanced meals. If you don't do that, it can be very tempting to gorge on junk food, on ice cream, whatever, and that can affect your mood if you're not eating healthy. Obviously getting enough sleep, very easy to, to get off track with that. All kinds of things going on at all hours, whether it's parties or informal social opportunities. You don't get enough sleep. You won't be able to get up for class. You won't have the concentration for class, even if you do show up. 
So students have to self-regulate their sleep, their nutrition, their hygiene. They've got to stay on track with assignments. This is hugely challenging for many of the students I see with ADHD or autism or other LDs where they um, struggle with time management. And fortunately, some colleges offer help with this. If you happen to be a college that doesn't have academic coaches or a learning support program, you can hire someone on the outside to help you with that. So it's not like you, you shouldn't just say, oh, well, I'm not good at that and just flounder. There are resources to help you with all of these issues. Of course, managing temptations to fall into addictive patterns, whether it's physical substances or um, electronic habits. Without your parents around, it can be very easy to get into an excessive use pattern, whether it's the, you know, the first time you've tried alcohol or drugs or whether it's um, you know, online activities. And this can easily derail students. And once students get off track and fall behind in college, it can be very hard to catch up um, during the semester if they've missed some big assignments. So it's really important to stay on top of these issues. And managing money, easy, easy to overlook that one, uh, but this is uh, a time of great independence for students. In high school, well, I'll, I'll come back to, to how to deal with this, but uh, how, to, how to address these challenges. But uh, this is an important time for students to be developing these skills, managing independently, and that includes money, and managing your emotional reactions to things. So you might be wondering, gee, that's a long list of skills. What if my students don't have all these skills by the time they go to college? Again, I'm not suggesting that successful students have 100% of these skills mastered. I'm just saying these are sort of aspirational goals to shoot for. These are things to, to try to optimize as much as possible to be successful in college. So I'm gonna talk about three different time periods when you can work on college readiness. The first is while you're still in high school. If you've looked at the, this list of, of skills that you need to be successful in college um, as the IEC, as the parent, as the student and realized, wow, I'm not very good in this area. First thing to do is to try to get better at it while you're still in high school. Now, parents can help with some of these skills. They can, you know, teach their kids how to do laundry, teach their kids how to cook. Uh, there might be courses offered at their high school, courses in personal finance. Uh, honestly, I think that personal finance or financial literary, literacy could turn out to be the most useful course that, that many high school students ever take in high school. Um, no offense to teachers of other subjects, but it's an incredibly important skill. Um, Access tutoring, of course, um, there's always opportunities for that in high school. Counseling to develop some of those emotional skills. Now, every, most students have access to a school counselor or guidance counselor. And of course, you can get a private therapist as well. And, uh, and then an executive function coach to help you learn how to manage your time and develop some systems, some, whether it's apps, schedules, timers, all kinds of different tools so that when you're in college, you have some of those things under your belt and you're able to handle your, your time more effectively. By the way, feel free to put questions or comments into the chat at any point and I'll, I'll try to uh, get to them at the end. Talked about working on skills while you're still in high school. So then the next time period would be between high school and college. So All students, uh, most students have the option of taking a gap year. And although it's good to plan this in advance, you can make this, you don't really don't have to make this decision until you're at that point of committing to a college. So students can be on the fence about it in their senior year. And then when they are committing around May 1st in senior year, if they need, want, or need an additional year before they're gonna be fully college ready, they can tell the college, here's the deposit. I'm, I'm thrilled to, that you accepted me. I do wanna attend, but I wanna attend a year from this coming fall, not this fall. And then use that, that year to develop skills to be more adult. And there are many different ways to structure a gap year. There's no one uh, best way to do that. It's, it can be customized for the student. It could be simply getting paid employment 
or starting their own business. Could be an independent project relating to something that they're passionate about, something that they hope to study in college. Could be volunteer community service work, traveling, or enrolling in a college readiness or postgraduate program, which is going to help buff up their academic readiness, their executive function skills, potentially their social skills, depending on that particular program. And many students with, uh, with learning differences or who are emotionally immature or struggling in some of these areas can benefit from this year and from all those skills. And if you do nothing else, if you just get a job or volunteer, you're gonna have to be responsible, show up on time, interact professionally with other people. So you're gonna learn a lot of skills as long as you're not just sitting at home doing nothing. That, that year could be very valuable. In addition, the part of the brain that, that is involved in executive functioning, the frontal lobes, the part of the brain that is involved in organizing, planning, judgment, inhibiting impulses to do harmful things, that part of the brain continues to develop well into our 20s, mid to late 20s. So an additional year before you start college means your brain is going to be just a little bit more mature. You will hopefully be have a little bit better judgment, be a little bit less impulsive, be a little bit better at planning your time and organizing and making smart decisions, even if you don't do anything else during that year. Of course, I would hope that students would use that year constructively. So I mentioned college readiness programs, transition programs, postgraduate programs. Sometimes students will just do a short summer program, two, three weeks, maybe a little bit more. Number of colleges, a uh, number of organizations offer these programs and some of them are located at colleges. There are also year long college readiness programs. So it could be something the student does during a gap year. And this is an opportunity to work on those executive function skills, potentially independent living skills, social skills, so that when, you, when you're in college, you'll have more skills under your belt. Here's one example of a transition or readiness program. Westport College Prep, it's specifically for students with learning differences. It can be virtual for students nationwide. There's some dual enrollment with Landmark College. Landmark is a college in Vermont for students with learning differences. And uh, so students get some little bit of college credit for that course. They get coaching on academic skills, work on life skills. There's also a community service aspect uh, orientation to this particular program. So it's a really a giving back uh, mentality and trying to make the world a better place in addition to improving your own skills. Here's another example, CIP, College Internship Program, which has locations nationwide from Massachusetts to California. They have summer programs as well as full year programs. Um, many students who go there are on the spectrum, but by no means all the students who go there Students are typically living in apartments very close to the program, walking distance to where the, the daytime programming is. So they are learning the skills of living with a roommate, cooking skills, planning their day. There's typically, if you're on the academic track, this will be located near one or more colleges where you can take college courses, might be community college, might be another private college. There's support after you leave the program and there's a link to the parents and the, the family is engaged as well. So it's not just, uh, you know, parents dropping the kids off for a year. Parents are in the loop. So I mentioned we talked about working on your on your skills while you're in high school. Taking that gap year to build your skills between high school and college. The third and final time that you can work on these skills is while you're in college. Now that might seem like, you know, building the plane while you're flying it. How can I be in college if I don't even have the skills yet? But this isn't a black or white thing where students either have all the skills they need or they don't. So once you're in college, there are still lots of resources to help you continue 
to be as to, to thrive and be as successful as possible. Some colleges have a dedicated structured learning support program. Part of my job is to know where, where these programs are located and which ones are going to be a good fit for which students. And most colleges do not have those programs. So if your student has, let's say, ADHD, dyslexia, autism, they need a, supports above and beyond the basic disability accommodations that are available at any college in the US, they need to select specific colleges that have those programs. What if the issue is more, let's say, substance abuse or something related to mental health? Well, some colleges have living learning communities, LLCs. It might be a dedicated floor on the residence hall, or in a few cases, it could be even a separate hall that is focused on wellness, where everyone has pledged to be substance free. And they might have a meditation room, they might have yoga classes, where it's really focused on wellness. That could be a really good support for students who need to work on their emotional skills. The vast majority of Colleges that I'm aware of offer some degree of free mental health counseling, so students can continue to work on skills to, with the help of a professional counselor. Of course, there is all kinds of advising available at college. I mentioned academic advisors, career advisors. It's again that self advocating, use those resources that are there, they can help you work on these skills. If you're going to be getting summer jobs in college or looking for internships, you should be going to the Career Center so that they can help you optimize your LinkedIn profile and optimize your resume and optimize your interviewing skills so that when that time rolls around and you're applying for those opportunities, you are a stronger candidate. And those are critical life skills. And then of course, you know, I mentioned tutoring, which is uh, free tutoring, free peer tutoring tends to be available uh, quite regularly at college. Now, what if a student ends up at a college that doesn't have one of those special structured high powered learning support programs or academic support programs, but they still need those supports. And believe me, this happens all the time. You might think, well, you should go to one of those colleges that have the su supports. Well, there's a lot of reasons why students don't. Um, maybe they're choosing a college based on price what the family can afford. Maybe they're choosing location. They want to be close to home. Maybe they're choosing based on a major. They have a very specific major and they've chosen a college that's really good for that field of study. Whatever the reason is that they've chosen, maybe they want to be with a sibling or a friend. It's a personal issue that why they're going to that college. If they end up with a at a college that doesn't have the supports they need, and this does happen all the time, all is not lost you can still get additional support from outside the college by hiring a private executive function coach. And I know folks who will do this virtually for students nationwide. Uh, if the college mental health services are not sufficient, let's say maybe the college's resources, they limit you to six sessions or eight sessions for the whole semester. Well, maybe that's not enough for you. Or maybe you need medication and the college doesn't have a prescriber. You can find somebody in the community and go outside of the college to get those resources. Since the pandemic, as I'm sure you all know, there's much more telehealth than there ever was before. So it doesn't mean students have to somehow get into a vehicle and drive to a private therapist or prescriber's office. They might just be able to sit in the privacy of their dorm room and have that session and evaluation from on campus with an external professional. Typically in the US, the provider, the psychologist, psychiatrist, counselor has to be located in the same, they have to be licensed in the state where their client or patient is physically located. So if the student's going to school in Ohio and they wanna see a counselor or a therapist, uh, a therapist or a psychiatrist, typically that person needs to be licensed in Ohio too. Um, even if the student's home state is somewhere else. So this can be a little tricky if the student is coming from home in Florida and they have a therapist that they worked with in high school and they're like, I'm just gonna continue with my same therapist remotely via telehealth in college. Well, that might not be legal. 
based on licensing laws. So that is something that families should be looking into, setting up, researching while the student is still in high school. So there's no unpleasant surprises of, oh, who's going to refill my prescription? Uh, I can't get it prescribed across state lines, and I don't know how to find a doctor near college. I'm just going to go off my medication. Not a good idea when you've made that big leap to college. There are fairly comprehensive programs available virtually to students nationwide. Um, Campus Connections, just one example. They happen to be headquartered in Texas, um, but they serve students in person in Texas and Nevada. They're expanding to other states, but they can work with students nationwide. In, there happens to also be one in the Boston, uh, Massachusetts, Focus Collegiate. They serve students in person in the greater Boston area and virtually nationwide. Focus Collegiate, uh, Campus Connections a bit more career oriented. So each program has its strengths. But again, there are programs that students can get access to, even if they end up at a college that doesn't have those comprehensive programs. And then finally, if a student needs even a higher level of support, they could live in a residential program and attend a nearby college. So I mentioned CIP as one example. Mansfield Hall is a slightly different model. They have locations in Oregon, Vermont, and Wisconsin. And students will live at Mansfield Hall and attend one of several nearby colleges. Uh, there's a program called Summit Campus, which is just opening this fall in Massachusetts, in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, and there, there are a number of different programs around the country where students can live there, get wraparound support, in-person support where they're living, emotional support, academic coaching, independent living skills, social skills, um, and then attend one of several nearby colleges located close to the program. That is a very expensive option for the most part. So not all families can afford that option. I've, I've referenced learning support programs. And again, I just want to encourage folks to put questions in the chat. I mentioned learning support programs. So frequently, this is an additional fee. That can be an unpleasant surprise if you haven't done your research. I do know of some colleges where there isn't an additional fee, but in many cases, it's an additional cost above and beyond the already high cost of tuition. If a student gets services at the college, it's probably going to be more coordinated, meaning that if you can't figure out how to register for classes, the person at your college's learning support program is much going to be more able to quickly point you in the right direction than someone who doesn't work at the college. If you are on the spectrum and you also need help with social skills or social opportunities, there are programs that are even more specialized, that is autism support programs for those students. And that can be a great opportunity, a great option for students who struggle socially. And in case you're wondering, hey, how do you find these great programs? Uh, I've actually listed the autism support programs on my website, topcollegeconsultants.com. So if you're looking for these programs, um, that's a good central place to find them. Uh, as far as learning support programs, um, I have some of them listed. I also know a lot of them by heart. And, and these are opportunities to get the support throughout college, although you don't have to stay in these programs through, throughout college, you can most of the time. Here's one example, Lynn University, Boca Raton. Uh, I was there early last year in 2020. Their program's been around for now 30 years. A good chunk of students at Lynn um, participate in the program. Their coaches are highly vetted, certified, academic coaches, and students get a substantial number of hours of service every week to make sure they stay on track and succeed academically. The reason I mentioned that a fair chunk of students go to the program is that there's no stigma associated with it because it's a very common thing. So students shouldn't feel worried that, oh, I'm going to be seen differently or treated differently because I'm in this special program. Another example, Fairleigh Dickinson in New Jersey, I didn't mention the town because they actually have two different campuses, Teaneck and Madison, New Jersey. Um, Regional Center for Learning Disabilities. Uh, one of the things I love about this 
program is there's no additional fee. Also, priority registration. That means you get to register for classes before the rest of the students in the university. And even if this cost money to be in this program, I would say it's worth it for that benefit alone. It means you're more likely to actually get the classes that you want. They've got courses in helping you master uh, learning strategies, coaches, assistive technology, wor workshops, lots of resources. I mentioned Landmark briefly. There's only two colleges in the whole country, in the whole US, that are exclusively for students with learning differences. That's Beacon in Florida and Landmark in Vermont. I've been to both of them. They're both small. And small can be good in the sense that they're easy to navigate. They're not overwhelming. Uh, but small also means there's not as many majors, there's not as many clubs or sports. So there's no perfect size, but uh, you know, different sizes, colleges have advantages and disadvantages. And they offer summer programs and transition programs. So even if a student says, oh, that's not the college I want to go to, they could be a good opportunity to help them build some college readiness through one of their transition programs or summer programs. And both of them have some programs available to students while they're still in high school. This is not just for after you've graduated. If you're working with students who are still in high school, Landmark and Beacon both have resources for them. A few quick tips, just sort of bonus slide here. If you're working with students who have learning differences or other kinds of disabilities, physical, medical disabilities, students need documentation of that and it needs to be current. For many colleges, that means within three years of starting college. I encourage students to get in touch with disability offices early. When I say early, I mean when they are shopping for colleges, when they are looking at colleges, not after they've committed. Because the last thing you would want is to commit to a college, visit the disability center only to find out that they're understaffed or that you don't like the people who work there and you're gonna have to deal with these people for four or more years. Learn about what's available, um, the question of whether you disclose the disability during the application, that's a whole other topic, but it comes up a lot. My general advice is if there's something important on, on the college application that's perhaps confusing, this could be an opportunity to explain it. And then, of course, you know, talked about the value of gap year college readiness programs. Big takeaways, make sure you're thinking about college readiness while the students are still in high school. Start working on those skills as early as possible and have a plan to continue to master those skills after the student finishes high school. Couple of resources, uh, these, these are actually, these links are all on my website, topcollegeconsultants.com. So if you go to the media page, you'll see those in case you're trying to frantically scribble these down. So some, articles and tips on college readiness. And there's my contact information if you have any questions for me. I would love to answer any questions folks have. I'm gonna wait I don't and see if there's- see any questions just yet, but I do I do wanna point out, you said like for those who, of who are um, frantically scribbling this, we are going to send a copy of this. So don't worry um, too much. We um, You will get a copy of this where you get the exact link. So um you'll get the resources because i know your presentation uh dr Anley, it has so many resources that it would have been really hard for me to take notes also mm -hmm. so a copy of the presentation would be really helpful for all the attendees is that their last uh slide no. yes it is um i did i saw one question that is about the programs are the courses always offered at the same semester as shown now on the online schedule is it advised to take several at the same time so we are a quarter basis um, for the required courses we try our best to offer them every single quarter with the exception of the practicum is not offered in the fall and then for the electives we rotate them so you will see that each quarter we offer at least two to three electives per quarter um, and it's, I would advise to take no more than two courses per quarter, especially if you're brand new to the field. Um, and if you have other, any other commitments, such as having a full-time employment, if you take more than two, it might be, it might not be the best learning environment or experience for you. So one or two courses would be um, the most ideal. I agree. Having gone through the program myself, um, I did 
generally take two courses at a time. Mm -hmm. And there's so much information. You learn so much that I feel like if you took three, even it's not that you wouldn't pass the courses. It's just that it would be hard to absorb that much information. Exactly. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, we do have a few more minutes, but if there's no other questions, I will leave all my information here. Oh, um, you have one question. I'll read it for you. Any advice on how to go about getting tested for a learning disability? How to approach this with a student? Sure. So um, frequently, this has already been flagged somewhere along the, the line for a student uh, by a teacher or a parent or other professional. Um, but if in some cases, this is not unheard of, it's the IEC who picks up on it, who, who sees this pattern and, and wonders if the student has that, has an issue that they could be tested for. Um, you, it's not just approaching with the student, it's also approaching with the parent. Um, it needs to be, you know, delicate. And I think depending on your level of expertise, you would want to stick with the facts that you've observed. Um, you know, student is telling me they've had years and years of difficulty focusing in class. Students telling me that they've always struggled with reading or writing or math. Um, has that have they ever gotten tested for this? Um, you know, this would be a conversation with the parents, not just with the student. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, I've seen other students with this pattern, you know, in some cases it indicates something you might want to look into having that explored before they start college so that they can get additional resources if they need it. And then uh, usually that, so if, if a, uh, a school system can do the testing, Usually you're gonna get more comprehensive, detailed testing if you pay for it privately. Sometimes health insurance will pay for uh, at least a good chunk of it, um, but it partly depends on the indications for the testing. So if families have to pay for a full neuropsych testing battery out of pocket, it can be thousands of dollars. So if you can get it paid for by insurance or if you can get it done by the school system, you're gonna save a lot of money, um, but typically it's done by a neuropsychologist or a team of, in the case of the school system, it could be a few different folks doing the testing. Thank you. I was mm -hmm. gonna ask any advice on how to encourage students to, when they get to college, because I know personally, there are some students with LD who, when they go to college, they're like, okay, I don't wanna disclose, I wanna do things on my own, but then the service and resources are right there. So how would you encourage them to seek that help? Yeah, that is that is always a challenge. I'm not going to say that it's easy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one way to think about it for students is you know get the thing, get the all of the things lined up. Get get all learn about the resources. Get your accommodations through your the Office of Disabilities. Meet with the tutor. Meet with the academic coach. Um, just get the wheels turning. And you know, if you are halfway through that semester and things are easy and you find that you don't even need the tutor, you don't need the academic coach, you don't need the accommodations, great. But if you do, if it turns out that, that those things are, are making all the difference between passing and failing, then that's great that you already have them in place because as I said before, it would be very difficult to catch up if you realize, oh, I really do need that extra time on tests. Um, now that I've failed half of my tests in this class, it's going to be very hard to make up for lost time. Yeah, I'm guessing much easier to, to 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 start with those resources and and uh, not use them or or give them up later on than the other way around. Got it. That's understandable. Yeah, because those resources, even though they're there, it's not like the student just show up in the office of disability and boom, all the resources are there for them. There has to be some right. kind of paperwork involved and process, exactly. right? Yeah, could okay. could take some time. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, if there's no other questions, uh, again, I leave my contact information here. Within two business days, I will send the recording as well as a copy of the presentation to everyone who registered. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and gained some insight helping your students or even your child with college readiness. Hopefully, you also saw some courses that pique your interest, and we hope you will consider adding on fully online your professional portfolio. Thank you again, Dr. Endlich. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.